applause. Now thank me for turning the microphone on, and we'll all be happy today. There we go. Technology, such a wonderful thing. I was thanking Chuck for leading that song today. Uh, I didn't ask him to do that, but I know that my Redeemer lives. That's what this sermon series is about. We can know that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And the evidence is there. It is a historic event that actually happened. But a lot of times when we're talking to people, they don't know that. They think it's a story that was made up to give people hope. And so in our lessons that we've been going through, we've been kind of showing that, you know, no, this is something that really did happen. And, and I don't say that, and I don't believe it just because I was brought up thinking that. I believe it because I've looked at the evidence. And all of the evidence comes out in favor of the fact that this really did happen. We started a couple of weeks ago looking at the gap between when the events occurred and when the New Testament documents were written and the fact that that's a pretty narrow gap. There wasn't a lot of time for things to change and shift and develop and become myths in that short period of time. Last week we looked at the authors. Who were these guys that wrote especially the Gospels and what would have been the motivation behind their writing and did that motivation affect their ability to accurately record history? And we saw that yes, they did have an agenda but that agenda actually required them to be more accurate and reliable in their recording of history than the opposite. This morning, we're going to look at what, what I'm calling the discrepancies or the synoptic problem. A lot of times people read through the Bible and they say, you know, there's just a lot of discrepancies in there. There's a lot of errors in there. There's a lot of contradictions in there. And so we're not, we don't have time to go through all of those this morning, and we're going to kind of focus on just the gospel. We don't really have time to go through all the discrepancies and the, and the contradictions, quote unquote, that we find in there. But what I want to try to do is give you some information that can help you when you're talking to people who bring these things up. We're going to deal with the discrepancies that come up in the gospels, especially the first three. Now, these first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we call them the synoptic Gospels. Not anything mystical about that word. It just means they're kind of similar. They're kind of the same. And in a minute, I'm going to show you how similar and how much the same they are. But the problem is that if you read through them, you're going to notice that they're similar, but you're also going to notice some differences. And some people will call these differences discrepancies. Now, I want to share with you something that, that Craig Bloomberg says in one of his books. He says, the New Testament has been scrutinized more intensely than any other part of history in the world. And, and that's probably true, because any other history in the world doesn't, isn't life or death, <coughs> but the New Testament is. If it is true, accurate history, then, it's gonna, it, then it tells us that our eternal salvation is in jeopardy and is at stake. And people don't like the fact that, that this one book or this collection of writings has that much of an impact. And so they scrutinize it, man. They look through everything. And what I think a lot of people that, that scrutinize the New Testament, they're trying to find problems mm -hmm. because they don't want to believe it. And so they're trying to find discrepancies. I think we can explain the reason for many of those discrepancies. Uh, we're not going to do that this morning, but I do want to share with you some of the questions that they bring up. Because here's, here's the way their argument goes. Alright, if all three of these books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, if all three of these accounts are telling the same story, then why do they get the chronology mixed up sometimes? And what I mean by chronology is the order of the events. Why does Matthew put one in the middle of his gospel where Luke says it happened at the beginning of Jesus' ministry? And why are there differences in wordings? If they're all telling the same story, why don't they get the words just right? And I want to—I I wasn't going to do this, but then this morning I decided I'm going to. And I want to have you turn with me to a couple of places. I'm going to share with you some of the things that they bring up. We're going to start in Mark chapter 4. This is on page 710 in your Brown Pew Bible. Mark chapter 4. You're going to begin in verse 35. 
Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35, page 710 in the Brown Pew Bible. This is the story of Jesus calming the storm. Mark's account. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. And there were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on, the, on, the, on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now, in that account, Jesus gets up, calms the storm, rebukes the disciples, and accuses them of having no faith. Keep that in mind. Rebukes the storm, or calms the storm, rebukes the disciples, no faith. Now, Matthew chapter 8, page 8, 686 in the Pew Bible. Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 23. Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 23. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. His disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And he replied, O ye, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. So, Luke, Mark says, he gets up, calms the storm, rebukes the disciples, say they have little faith. Matthew says, he gets up, rebukes the disciples, calms the storm, and says they have little faith, where Mark said they have no faith. Is this the same story? Why is there a difference in the order of events? Why is the language different? And some people will look at that and say, see, there's discrepancies in the New Testament. Another one I want to share with you real quickly, uh, and since we're in Matthew, uh, turn over to Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, on page 682. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. This is at when Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, in chapter 3, verse 17. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now I'll flip back over to Mark chapter 1, verse 11. Page 807 in the Pew Bible. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. And a voice came from heaven you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Luke's gospel reports it exactly the same way. In Mark's gospel and in Luke's gospel, Jesus, or God is speaking to Jesus. You are my son, with whom I am well pleased. In Matthew's gospel, God is speaking to everybody else, saying, this is my son. Aren't they telling the same story? Why is there a difference in it? Another one, I'm not going to have us go back and look at it. You can look these up on your own if you want to. In Mark, uh, it talks about John the Baptist being in prison in the middle of Jesus' Galilean ministry. Jesus was, had a ministry that ran throughout Galilee, and in the middle of that ministry, you hear the story about uh, John the Baptist being thrown into prison. But in Luke's Gospel... That telling of that story occurs at the very beginning of Jesus' Galilean ministry. So when did it happen? In the middle or at the beginning? If you go into uh, the call of Peter in, in uh, Peter, James, and John, in Luke, it comes later than it does in Mark. In Mark, we have this story right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. 
where Jesus is walking down the beach and he turns to Peter and those guys and he says, hey, come follow me. And they leave everything and they go follow him. And it's kind of this, boom, miraculous kind of thing. In Luke's gospel, it happens a little bit later. Jesus has been kind of going around and preaching and teaching. And here, Jesus doesn't just walk by and say, hey, you guys come follow me. Instead, Jesus goes down and gets into a boat with Peter. And they push out and they go out. And Jesus says, hey, drop your net down on this side. So Peter drops his net down. They pull up this miraculous catch of fish. And then Peter decides to follow him. So what happened? When did it occur? And what were the events? What were the what was the chronology of that all? And why are the stories just a little bit different? Now, some will look at that and say, "Hey, that tells us we can't trust these guys. Their stories aren't the same." But I'm going to share with you this morning. I'm not going to go through and say, "Well, here's why this is different," and all of this kind of stuff. We'd be here all day long. But instead what I want to do is I want to share with you some information about the writers of the Gospels, how they wrote, why they wrote, that might explain why there are some differences in these things. First of all, I want to share with you a couple of different facts. And by the way, most of my information for this morning, not all of it, but a lot, a lot of it comes out of this book written by F.F. F. Bruce called The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable? Excellent, excellent book. If you ever want a book to read on how we can know that the New Testament are reliable historical documents, it's a good one to read. But a couple of things I want to bring to, to, to your mind that we need to understand. And first of all, that is differences in accounts actually suggests truthfulness. If you bring two eyewitnesses into court to testify to something that they saw, if their stories are absolutely identical word for word, there is more of a chance that they got together and came up with a lie than if they just tell their story and there's some differences in it. In fact, most police officers, law enforcement officers, and judges will tell you that differences in the story by eyewitnesses actually adds credibility more than it detracts from that. The other thing I want you to keep in mind is that the form of a report can make two accounts of two events sound like two accounts of one event. Now, this one's a little hard to follow, so bear with me here. Let's say that a police officer is called into court to testify about a traffic accident that he went and made a report on. Now, when he makes that report in court and he gives his information, he has a pretty set form of how he's going to go through the details of that accident and what he observed when he got there. The reason for that is that way he can make sure he gets all of the information out and it's done in an orderly fashion and it's set in a certain kind of specific form of retelling that makes sure he gets all of his information out there. You guys with me? Does that make some sense? He doesn't just get up, and get up there and start talking, well, Joe and I was driving down the road that day and we heard that there was a car accident. And so we turned around and we drove past McDonald's and we went, drove past Hardee's and we drove past Dunkin' Donuts and we finally got to the place where the accident... He doesn't just start telling a story. He says, we arrived on the scene at such and such time and we noticed that, that EMS was already there and he just kind of goes through just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. But it's always in a pretty set order. Now, if you went in one morning and you listened to an officer give an account of a traffic accident, and then you came back about two hours later and he gave a report of another traffic accident, you came back a little bit later and he gives a report of another traffic accident, if you listened to the reports, they may all sound so similar that you might think he's just telling the same story. That was all, it was one accident, he's just told about that one accident three times. Yeah, he's got a little bit of information different. But it was actually three different incidences, but the way he reports it sounds real similar. Sometimes when we read accounts in the New Testament, like the story of Jesus' calming the storm when the disciples are on the boat, is that one time that that ever happened? Or did it happen twice and we're getting two different accounts of two different events? Yeah. Two, the form of a report can make two accounts of two events sound like two accounts of one event. I don't know if that's the same story being told two different ways or not. But I just want you to keep a couple of those things in mind. So, now, 
that I've got you totally, totally confused. So, about the synoptic gospels. First of all, I want to talk about where they're similar, where they're different. We call them the synoptics because they're very much the same. 606 out of the 661 verses of Mark appear in Matthew. Matthew, in some ways, almost copied Mark. Not completely, not everything is exactly word for word. Some stuff is very close. A lot of stuff is just real similar, similar uh, events that occur told in very much a similar way. 350 of the 661 verses of Mark appear in Luke with very little change. So it appears that uh, probably when Matthew and Mark, or Matthew and Luke sat down to write their gospel, they probably had a copy of Luke and used it. In fact, only 31 verses in Mark have no parallel in Luke or in Matthew. So if you drew this out in a circle, and I was going to do this, but my circles would have been really, really confused. you got Mark's gospel, and then you've got Matthew's gospel that covers almost all of Mark, and then you've got Luke's that covers a good part of it. There's only a little bitty slim line of Mark that's not found anywhere else in there. So there's some of the similarities that we see in there. If you, can, if you look at Matthew and Luke together, about 250 parallels in Matthew and in Luke that aren't parallels in, Luke, in Mark. Now I know this may be getting a little confusing, but Matthew and, and Luke have passages that are almost the same, stories that are almost the same, almost word for word, but those aren't found in Mark's gospel. We'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Of the 1,068 verses in Matthew, only about 300 don't appear in either Mark or Luke. They're totally, completely Matthew's own verses. And of the 1,149 verses of Luke, only about 550 contain material that doesn't appear in Mark or Matthew. And so there's a lot of overlap in these Gospels. Which, and, and the fact is, when people look at it, they say, so why the similarities and why the differences? If they're going to copy from each other, it should be pretty much verbatim. And if they're copying from each other, then why do we have different stuff in Matthew and Luke than we have in Mark? Now, I want to talk a little bit about some of these overlaps here, especially the 250 parallels of Matthew and Luke that aren't in Mark. Now, by the way, as in all of these lessons I've been doing, I do not have enough time to go through all of this as in-depth as I would like to. Just throwing some stuff out here for you to think about. If you have any questions about any of this, come and see me afterwards. We'll spend a lot of time talking about that. Because I'm not going to solve all of this problem this morning. I'm just going to give you some information about how the Gospels were written and where some of the discrepancies might come down. 250 passages that are parallel in Matthew and Luke that aren't found in Mark. This has led a lot of scholars to say that evidently Matthew and Luke have some other writing that they used that recorded some of these events. Now, this is what scholars refer to as the Q, or as Q material, Q source. It's not any mysterious thing. They say there was evidently some writings, particularly of the sayings of Jesus, that we don't have today, that evidently Matthew and Luke had access to. Now, a lot of people don't like the thought of there being some supposedly theorized material out there. Uh, it just boggles their mind, and you're probably thinking, oh, Lance is going off to the liberal deep end here, but I'm really not. And here's why. If you remember a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the gap between when the events occurred and when they were written down, and I shared with you something that Papias had written about Matthew. And Papias said, uh, that's not the one that I'm looking for. I'll get back to that in just a minute. Papias had said that Matthew had actually begun putting together a list of sayings of Jesus in the Aramaic. And some scholars, F.F. F. Bruce, and I tend to think this may be true, that this Q source that Matthew and, and Luke used may have been Matthew's sayings of Jesus that he had written down. And so, as each of them sat down to write their gospel, 
They used their own knowledge. They used knowledge of things that others had written down. They used oral tradition, and they put all of these together. And so, I want us to look at each of the gospel writers, who they were, where their material came from, and maybe what their purpose was. I want to begin with Mark here this morning. Mark, according to Papias, he wrote down what Peter preached. Now, it's interesting, if you read uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 22 through 24, and it didn't all come up on the slide, but if you, if you want to look this up, you can. It says, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did in your presence, or did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him up from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Now, that's the sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. First gospel sermon, and that's a big part of that sermon. It's not all of it, but it's a part of it. Sometime, take your Bible and open it up to Mark's gospel. And you don't have to read it word for word, but if you read the little uh, titles above each paragraph or above each section... You read through this, and what you're going to see is Mark's gospel kind of follows this. Miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among the people through Jesus. The man was handed over by God's set purpose. And with the help of wicked men, he was put to death by nailing him on the cross. God raised him up. That's Mark's gospel. There's a, there are some parts of Mark's gospel where Mark records... Uh, some of Jesus' dialogue, the things that he said. But for the most part, uh, Mark's gospel really just talks about what he did more than what he said. Bruce, F.F. Bruce in his, in his book points out that Mark's emphasis was mainly on the good news that by his death and, and triumph, he had procured remission of sins and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Mark's gospel is the shortest of all. His main focus is not on what Jesus said, but it's what he did. He proved that this was God by the signs and miracles and wonders that he did, and that he was put to death, and that he was raised from the dead. The last third of Mark's gospel is about the, the last week of Jesus' life. His death and his burial and his resurrection. And so that's a, a, a big part of what Mark's gospel is, is teaching people, this is what Jesus did to save you. This is what Jesus did to pay for your sins and guarantee that you have eternal life. And so Mark's gospel focuses on what Jesus did. But, here's the problem. After people are converted, now they need to know what Jesus said. Mark doesn't give us a lot of what Jesus said. But when you take the material, and I said that there's a lot of material in Luke and in Matthew that isn't in Mark, can you guess what that material might be? The things that Jesus said. And so when we get to Mark's or Matthew's gospel, Matthew, I think, was writing to people that needed to know the teachings of Jesus the things that Jesus had said. And so, uh, we're going to look uh, at Matthew's Gospel. Papias says, Matthew compiled the Logia. Now this is, I, I got ahead of myself, this is a key material, that material is not in Mark. Uh, Papias said, Matthew compiled the Logia, or a collection of sayings of Jesus, in the Hebrew speech, which would have been Aramaic, and everyone translated them as best he could. Now, this I'm going to go back to that kind of Q material, that material that's in Matthew and it's in Luke, but it's not in Mark. Mostly the sayings of Jesus. Now, one of the interesting things is there's differences, and that makes sense because, as Papias said, everybody translated them as best as he could. They translated them out of Aramaic into Hebrew. Matthew was a, was a Jew. He spoke Aramaic. Luke was a Gentile. Aramaic would have been a second, third language to him. 
So if they're both translating something out of Aramaic, their translations are going to be a little different. Maybe that's why Luke is a little bit different than Matthew. Makes sense. Scholars have gone back, the people that really know what they're doing, and they've analyzed Matthew's, got Matthew's material and Luke's material, and they said, you know, these stories could all be from the same source in Aramaic. They're both translations of an Aramaic source into Greek. And what they also found out was if you take these things that are common in Luke and common in Matthew that are worded a little differently and you translate them from Greek back into Aramaic, you end up with kind of a poetic type language with rhyme uh, and rhythm. And sometimes even the, the words rhyme like our poetry does today. And what's really interesting about that, again, we're talking about the sayings of Jesus they say that in Aramaic, that was the style that a lot of Old Testament prophets used. If you want to say something that you want people to memorize, put it in the form of a poem. Put it in the form of a song. Because if it's in a rhythmic form, we tend to remember it a little better. Think about commercials you heard when you were a kid growing up. My baloney has a first name. It's O-S-E-A-R. My baloney has a second name. It's M-A-Y-E-R. Oh, I love to eat it every day. And if you ask me why, I'll say... Because Oscar Mayer has a way. B-O-L-O-G-N. Boy, you guys have got to wake up this morning. How many of you know that song? Okay, the next time we sing, sing it out. Okay, we need the Oscar Mayer song. Take these, these Greek texts in Matthew and Luke, and you translate them back into Aramaic, they take on the kind of language someone would have said if they wanted people to memorize their teaching. So, moving on again. So if that's the case, how do we just, uh, explain some of the differences? Matthew F.F. F. Bruce says all this material in Matthew has been arranged so as to serve a purpose, the purpose of a manual for teaching and administration within the church. If Mark wrote a short, concise, this is what Jesus did, this is what he did to save you, and Mark comes, or Matthew comes along and says, now you need to know some of the things that he said. Now he sits down and he composes a manual for teaching, and for church administration. And so he's not just talking about the things that Jesus did, but also the things that he said. He, uh, Bruce goes on to say that the sayings of Jesus are arranged in Matthew's Gospel so as to form five great discourses dealing with, first of all, the law of the kingdom of God, then the preaching of the kingdom, then the growth of the kingdom, the fellowship of the kingdom, and the consummation of the kingdom. And, it, and if you look at it, it's all broken down that way. And he says, in between these discourses, and what I mean by discourse is when Jesus is talking and teaching and saying things, in between those discourses, Matthew weaves the story and the, and the text of Jesus' ministry so that at the end of a part of Jesus' ministry, it flows directly into one of these discourses. And so it's woven together so that all of these discourses are grouped together by topic. Matthew's also, well, Matthew, asked, before all of this, before he gets to these five subdivisions, he begins with a preface, kind of a prologue of the story that talks about the virgin birth of the king. And then at the end of the story, at the end of all of this, he comes to the epilogue, which talks about the crucifixion and the resurrection of the king. Matthew is all focused about the king and the kingdom of God. And many scholars will draw parallels between Matthew's gospel and the Old Testament. Some have even demonstrated how Matthew has arranged his material to follow a model of the fivefold structure of the Old Testament, kind of like what we see up here. He also stresses how the story of Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. So Matthew records historic events in order to teach certain aspects of how Jesus fulfills God's plan. Chronology is not necessarily important to him. It's not about getting all of the events 
in step-by-step -step order as it is for putting them together in a way that teaches who Jesus was, what Jesus taught, and how this is a continuation of fulfillment of God's story. So that's kind of how Matthew put his gospel together. And so now let's take a look at Luke. First of all, who was Luke? Well, we know first of all, Matthew was one of the twelve, right? He was an eyewitness to a lot of what took place. Mark was not an eyewitness. Mark got a lot of his story from what Peter preached. But what about Luke? Luke was not one of the original twelve. And Luke, you know, where did he get his story? Well, early church history tells us, early church tradition tells us that Luke was originally from Antioch. Now, if you want to take a look at, at Acts chapter 11, verse 19 through 21, we find out, now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. It could be that that's where Luke came into contact with the gospel the first time. He's a physician practicing in Antioch, and these men show up that are teaching about this Jesus of Nazareth. And Luke begins to get it involved in that, interested in it. Uh, in Galatians chapter 2 verse 11 we find out that Peter actually went to Antioch at one time. Uh, Paul talks about when Cephas or Peter came to Antioch, I confronted him to his face because he was in the wrong, he wasn't eating with the Gentiles, but it could be that Luke actually met Peter when he was there. We know uh, from his writings that he was a long time traveling companion with Paul in fact, in, when Paul is in prison, we find in Colossians, uh, Paul writes this, and again, it doesn't all come up there, but we see that down here at the bottom, our dear friend Luke is with us while we're here in prison. But what's interesting in that, when he's writing this letter, guess who else is there with, with Paul when he's in prison? This guy here named Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. Philemon uh, verse 23 and 24, again, Paul is writing while he's in prison. Luke is with him, and Demas is with him, and Aristarchus is with him, and guess who else is with him? Mark. Luke had a lot of contact with a lot of the upper echelon in early Christianity. The traveling companion of Paul possibly met Peter one time. We know that he met Mark. He also talked to a lot of eyewitnesses that were around us. So that's where Luke gets his information. He talks to eyewitnesses, others who have written things down, probably had a copy maybe of, of Matthew's, and I say po probably, we don't know. The reality is we don't really know some of this stuff because we weren't there. Harley wasn't even there. <laughs> I heard somebody say one well, Harley was older than dirt, and he's not. Mud came after dirt. He might be older than mud, but not older than dirt. Nadine, I'm picking on Harley for you, okay? Because he's always picking on you, so I had to pick back. So. The fact is, none of us were there. We're making some presuppositions, and we're, we're guessing on some of these things. But we do know, if you read the uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 of, of Luke's Gospel, and I hadn't planned on reading this, but I think it's important that we read it. Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. Luke tells us of his investigation. He says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. And therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Keep that in mind. We'll get back to it. So that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. Luke had a lot of eyewitness, uh, eyewitnesses that he would have talked to. He had heard the oral teachings that the early church had set down. He had access to writings such as Mark's Gospel and who knows what else was out there. Now, so Paul or Luke is traveling with Paul. Paul, we know, gets arrested. Paul appeals to Caesar. 
Paul says, I'm a Roman citizen, and I've been arrested, and I'm held here, uh, and, and it's wrong, and I appeal to Caesar. And so Paul eventually goes to appear before Caesar. Luke goes with him. And this is what F.F. F. Bruce says. He says, Luke's arrival with Paul in Rome suggests itself as a fitting occasion for Luke's talk, taking in hand to draw up his orderly and reliable account of Christian beginnings. If the official and cultured classes of Rome knew anything about Christianity before, they probably dismissed it as a disreputable Eastern cult. But in the pres but with the presence, or but the presence in the city of a Roman citizen who had appealed to Caesar for a fair hearing in the case which involved the whole question of the character and aims of Christianity made it necessary for some members of these classes to examine Christianity seriously. The most excellent Theophilus to whom Luke dedicated his twofold history was possibly one of those charged with investigating the situation and such a work as Luke's would have been an invaluable document in the case. So here, think about this. If this is the case, and again, we don't know for sure that it is, Luke gets there to Rome. These Romans really don't know what Christianity is. To them, it's an Eastern cult. It's not really significant or anything. But Luke realizes Paul's going to stand before the emperor. And all these people are going to be investigating to see if what Paul has said is true. And Luke says he needs a defense. <clears throat> I'm going to write down, based upon my investigation and the eyewitness testimony, everything that's happened from the beginning. So you have the whole story. Now, Mark writes, a short, brief gospel. This is what Jesus did to save your soul. Matthew realizes people need a little more than that. And so he writes, not only is this what Jesus did to save your soul, this is what Jesus taught for how you should live, and this is how it all fits together. And so you can see that what happened with Jesus was a fulfillment of what God started at the beginning of time. Luke says some people need to understand the truth of everything from the beginning so that they know what the character of Christianity is. And so he sits down to write his gospel. All written using historic evidence. All written using eyewitness testimony. But written for a different purpose to tell different people the same thing. Written by different men. Are there differences? Yes, there are. But I'll tell you, to me, that doesn't make these guys less credible. It makes them more credible. And not only that, I want you to think about the fact that if we didn't need all three, the early church wouldn't have kept all three. They would have narrowed it down and said, you know what, we don't really need Mark and Luke, or Matthew and Luke. They're long. You ever sit down to read Matthew's gospel? You get so-and-so, beget so-and-so, beget so-and-so, beget so-and-so, and most people get about halfway through that and just close the book. The early church could have said, you know what, Mark's gospel is short, sweet, simple, let's just keep it. John comes along a little later. But they didn't. They said we need Mark. Tells the truth. Tells it accurately. We need Matthew. Tells the truth. Tells it accurately. Fills in the story a little more. We need Luke. Fills in the story even more. They're all accurate. They're all important. They all tell what Jesus did for you. They all tell what Jesus taught about how you should live. And they all tell about Jesus' resurrection. That he is the Messiah. And I know that my Redeemer lives. Not just because it's a feeling I've got but because history tells me that. And I hope that in this series, you're beginning to understand that our faith is not built on feelings. 
And I never will forget a guy, a lady I met one time, she told me she went to her dad. She said, Dad, I, I, I think I'm in love. And he said, why do you think you're in love? She said, I just got this feeling in my chest. And he said, that's gas. It will pass. <laughs> Our faith is not built on a feeling. It's built on evidence that a man named Jesus Christ came into this world and lived a sinful life and was put to death by wicked men, but he rose. That's not a wish, it's not a feeling, it's a fact. And because of that, we can stand and proclaim, I know that my Redeemer lives. And because He lives, I will live also. I hope this, through this series you're becoming more convinced on the truth of the gospel. Maybe this morning after the last couple of weeks, and by the way, if you missed the first two lessons, they're on YouTube. Go to our YouTube channel and you can watch them. Don't ask me how, but you can do that. I know you can. Don't watch those, but hopefully you're becoming more convinced. And maybe this morning you've decided, you know what, Lance, I think this is true. And I need to do something about it. And if that's where you are today, we're going to stand, we're going to sing a song. If you need to come forward and say, I really believe Jesus rose from the dead for my sins, and I want to accept that, today's an awesome day to do it. No matter who wins that football game yet this afternoon, you will have won eternal life if you make that choice today. So if that's where you are, come to the front while we stand and sing this song.